Okay, I'm going to give you an example of combining archival research with a path-dependent analysis in political science based on my own dissertation uh, research and subsequent uh, research on state building, what I call infrastructural power and political ideology in early 20th century Afghanistan and Iran. The big question that I have is why did Iran develop a strong state by the mid 20th century, a fairly strong one, whereas uh, Afghanistan did not, even though uh, in the early part of the 20th century they were quite similar to one another. So at some point one took one trajectory and then the other state took another and I argue that it was a path dependent process. Here you can see the empirical evidence for this in terms of road building, schools and university students and armed forces, the differential growth of the central state in both places. Here you've got the path dependent elements, you've got antecedent conditions, both Afghanistan and Iran were created or shaped, their external boundaries were shaped uh, by two imperial powers, Russia and Britain, who did not want to uh, directly uh, fight each other, so they created um, the boundaries of Iran and Afghanistan, although they did not directly colonize, they certainly influenced these countries to a large extent, but did not colonize these countries. So that's the antecedent conditions that make them quite different from their neighbors like Iraq or today's Pakistan. Then you have a critical juncture in the 1920s. There's a power vacuum, there's a choice among different political ideologies, um, which essentially boil down to a more uh, modernist versus traditionalist candidates, those who want to transform society and transform the way that the state and uh, the, uh, the rulers uh, hold themselves in power, whereas those who want things to stay more or less the same. Then you've got institutional reproduction, which is essentially how does that uh, tra trajectory stay in place after the initial choice. Well, this is all about central institutional strategy towards regional elites. Modernists want to um, usurp the power of all regional elites who are mostly uh, traditional landowners or tribal leaders. They want to um, usurp them and uh, replace them with central state institutions. Um, traditionalists want to replace those elites who they view as rivals, but those elites who they view as allies due to long-standing family or patronage ties, they let them stay in power uh, and have them autonomy. That would be the strategy of indirect rule. And then the long-term trajectory that results from this institutional reproduction is that you get a strong centralized state in Iran. In Afghanistan, you get a patchwork state that is strong in some areas and weak in others. This slide uh, gives you more information than you actually need to know. There's essentially four types of ideology that I uh, categorize. Um, the bureaucratic types are the modernist ones, the patrimonial ones are the traditionalist ones. Um, absolutism means those leaders who favor more, a more authoritarian form of government. Constitutionalists favor a more um, democratic or at least rules-based one. So you get these four types. But essentially uh, it boiled down to the modernist versus traditionalist choice. Here you can see that I've actually listed the candidates in Iran and Afghanistan who were in each camp. Uh, essentially you have representatives and potential candidates for power in the 1920s from all four camps, except in Afghanistan there wasn't really uh, a patrimonial uh, constitutionalist. In general, those who wanted democracy were considerably weaker in Afghanistan. In any case, the main choice was between those who wanted to transform society uh, and particularly the bureaucratic absolutists and those who wanted things to stay the same. Now my task was essentially to show that Nadia Shah was a traditionalist. Now some people said well 1929 uh, Amanullah Shah was overthrown um, by this uh, village big brigand, Habibullah Kalakani, because of his policies, his modernist policies, and he shouldn't have done it. And Nadia Shah learned from this, and when he came to power in 1929, he went in a more traditionalist direction. But I have to show that, in fact, Nadia Shah was a traditionalist from the very beginning. So I dug through some resources, and I found diplomatic cables uh, from the British representative in Kabul, 
uh, which shows that five years before he came to power, uh, Nadia Shah, in fact, can be shown to have traditionalist leanings. In 1924, he is the Minister of Defense of Amanullah, but he has a strong disagreement with him about a policy towards dealing with a tribal rebellion in the East. Amanullah wants to crack down pretty hard. Um, Nadir Shah has his allies there. He doesn't. And here he, uh, he resigns or is fired, depending on who you listen to. And then he goes and interacts with the um, British uh, minister before leaving Afghanistan and briefly serving as ambassador, Afghan ambassador to France. And here you can see that he clearly opposes Amir Amanullah's modernist policies. He thinks that they're far too quick and that Afghans can't handle them and one should rule on the basis of Afghan traditional um, norms and values. Now comes the element of institutional reproduction, the self-reinforcing mechanisms of ideology and power. In Iran, Reza Khan, then Reza Shah, systematically eliminates tribal leaders and regional elites. Uh, for instance, like Simko in Kurdistan. Nadia Khan treats some regional resistance with leniency and brutally cracks down on others. So, for instance, in Kurdistan, uh, what we call Tajik uh, region of Afghanistan, he brutally suppresses an uprising against the central state, offers 100 rupees for each Kurdistani head, uh, blows oppositionists from guns, takes all kinds of women and children as um, essentially uh, um, slaves. Um, but when it comes to the Pashtun tribal region, it's essentially the Afghan counterpart to Fatah, Loya Paktia, uh, what we call the, the southern province at the time. There was a case of the Darikheir Zadran, who um, rebelled against the central government. And I found a document in um, a newspaper where instead of brutally cracking down on them and calling them enemies of the state, Nadia Khan treats them kind of like naughty children, oh my woeful and ignorant children. So he punishes them, but seeks to incorporate them as quickly as possible. And here's the source for that that I found in Nadia Shah's uh, official um, um, newspaper, Isla, which I made lots of copies uh, from when I, was in an obs in a, when I was in a library in Omaha, Nebraska, specialized on Afghanistan. So I found uh, this uh, particular speech by Nadia Shah in, on January 3rd, 1933, where he's talking about the rebellious Darekha Jadran uh, tribe. Now, the copy here is a bit blurry, but uh, when I copy it into the PowerPoint presentation, but I can actually read it quite clearly um, it, uh, uh, from my computer. Now, for my long-term outcome, I have to show that in Iran, um, the central state extended its territorial reach over Iran quite rapidly, while in Afghanistan it didn't do so. So what I actually found was data on minor civil divisions. Those are those um, units of government below the provincial level. So this would be Tessia, division, county, that kind of thing. And I find that, in fact, in Afghanistan, the number of minor civil div divisions does not increase, even though the population increases. Whereas in Afghanistan, uh, whereas in Iran, the number of minor civil di uh, divisions increases quite rapidly uh, from Reza Khan, uh, uh, Khan's time period onward. So the, the territorial reach of the state extends quite rapidly in Iran, but in Afghanistan it doesn't. Now, I had to find data on the long-term trajectory. How did I find data on minor civil divisions? Well, I had to do archival research. So here are uh, several examples. Um, in the library in Omaha, Nebraska, and also in a library in a small, tiny little Swiss village called Bubendorf, um, I found the Kabul Almanac. The, it's an annual journal that the Afghan government brought out where they summarized affairs of state. And there you could sh see um, the institutional divisions of the Afghan state as they developed over time. Here you can see examples of Vilayat Mazai Sharif and Vilayat Herat, the province of Mazai Sharif, and the province of Herat, and their subdivisions. And so I could count those. Uh, and then um, that's for 1934, 1935. Then I found an English language provisional gazetteer of Afghanistan from 1975, where it just outright says how many minor civil divisions there were. So you have to kind of be a detective. You have to dig around and find 
sources to fill in the blanks. So now it's your turn to put into practice um, your knowledge on historical archival research. So pick a historical topic related to South Asia. That'll be easier, more practical for you. Do a basic, basic literature review on the topic um, of two or three articles, just so you have a background knowledge. Then you pick a cr key critical juncture and identify the relevant dates of that critical juncture, depending on what you want to look at. Partition is 1947, military coup 1958, or the military coup of 1977, or the military coup of 1999, um, or other such dates. Um, then you go to the Dawn Archive, or Hilal Magazine, or the Hindu, or the Times of India, or Guardian, uh, the archives of the Guardian. You conduct research on the topic um, from that particular time period. You can consult alternative sources if necessary. Uh, then analyze the results and pay particular attention to how your sources might color or interpret, it, uh, interpret the time period and how you might be, uh, need to be careful in taking that at face value. You write a three to four page paper, introduce your topic, and your research question, you do a brief review of the historical research of the time period, and then you look at the critical juncture uh, that you have examined. That's the part of the path-dependent framework that you're examining, and you look at the choices that were available. Were they, what choices were really realistically available? There has to be several for it to be a critical juncture. Which one was picked? Why was it picked? Why were not other choices picked? And in how far did your primary sources and their bias color the interpretation of the event? Might there have been more or less choices available than your sources reveal? Um, did they try to cover it up or did they just not consider them? So this is your writing assignment.